Hey, Patty. Uh, good, good feelings this week. I mean, did you dream that this would one day happen for you, that you'd be fighting in London, the O2, such a prominent place on the card? Yeah, I knew this would happen. No, watch just before we get started. If there's any reporters from the Sun in here, don't dare ask me a question. Don't put me in that rag of a newspaper. Just thought I'd get that in. Yeah. End of. Um, but yeah, I knew this was going to happen, lad. Knew this was coming. Uh, I've envisioned all this, lad. I can't wait to get my hand raised on Saturday. And when there's pandemonium in the crowd, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, man. I mean, like, and this week, I mean, do you feel the added attention? Can you feel your star power growing more and more? I mean, even just outside of this week, everything that's been going on since the debut? Uh, yeah. Well, as I say, I've just took everything in my stride. I knew all this was coming in my future. It's only going to get bigger and better, lad. And it's going to continue to do so. Yeah, we had uh, Kazula in here earlier, and you know he was had some not so nice things to say. He said you're overrated, a lot of holes in your game. I mean, do you take any of this stuff seriously at this point, or do you think every opponent going forward is going to have something like yeah. this to say? Every opponent's going to say something like that. He's got to try and make himself feel good about something, and he because he knows I'm better than him wherever the fight goes. Doesn't matter if we're wrestling, we're doing jiu-jitsu, or we're striking. I'm better than him wherever the fight goes. All he's got in this fight is a puncher's chance. So mentally, for him, he needs to say, oh, he's not good at this and he's not good at that because he knows I'm going to punch his head in. Yeah, and as your star power gets bigger, you're going to have more critics, right, more haters, and maybe someone will say this week they see what happened yesterday with you and Ilya and they'll say, is Paddy po focused on the fight? Is he is his priorities in the right place? What would you say in response to that? Who's that? Oh, hand sanitizer boy? Is that who you mean? Oh, yeah, um, that's his name from that one. Lad. Don't refer to him as his name. Lad. His name's hand sanitizer because it got bounced off his head. But... I don't, I don't concern myself with none of that, lad. He wanted to come at me and try and act hard, and he got put in his place, lad. I was stood there on my own, and there was about six of them, and he'd done nothing. If he wanted to do something, he would have come round the table and tried to have a fight with me, but he didn't. He stood on the other side of the table because he knows what's good for him. Were you surprised in the moment that happened? Like, did it take you a second to realise what was going on and maybe get your guard up a little bit in terms yeah. of you know, realising where you were? Not and how really. Many people like... As soon as he come out of them double doors, lad, he snarled me, you know what I mean? So I looked at him and said, what? And then he walked towards me and I said, what's happening, lad? And then as he got close to me, he, um, he like, swiped the, swiped the slap at me, you know what I mean? And obviously, lad, if you raise your hand to me, I'm going to do something. So I wasn't punching him because I'm not breaking my hand and not being able to fight and earn me money on the weekend. So I stepped back and picked the hand sanitizer up and bounced it off his head. And then he swung a dig what I moved out of the way of with a bit of ease. He's just got a little bit of man, uh, small man syndrome, lad. You know what I mean? He's only 5'7", isn't he? So just try to leave the little men to it. Is, is that something that goes through your head in the moment? Like, hey, I have to do whatever I have to do to get myself in this situation, but I can't do something that could compromise the fight? Yeah, I can't, I can't let something like that happen, lad. I can't start throwing punches and get cut off the card or break me hand hitting someone. You know what I mean? Especially someone so meaningless. You know what I mean? Who, who even is he? Seriously? Who is Mr. Hand Sanitizer? Like, he's a no one. He used my name for followers and for to gain some publicity. And he put a video up and made himself look like a right tool. So, fair to say, even if he wins in spectacular fashion, you're not interested in that fight? He's not going to win, though. I know full well. I know Jai. I know Jai's going to knock him out and send him crawling back down to the featherweight division. So, if you win your fight the way you're hoping, what do you feel this leads to? Whatever I want. I don't need to call anyone out or mention anyone's name because everyone talks about me. That's how this works. Thanks, Paddy. Paddy just a quick one right here. Uh, you were talking about how you, you always knew this was coming and you, you're feeling your, your popularity ri rise, but when I landed here from the States, I got into my cab. The cab driver asked me what I was here for. I said UFC, and he immediately just said, I don't watch it, but tell me about Paddy the Batty. I've heard of him. So what about you draws people that don't even like this sport, but they know who you are and they want to watch you fight specifically? I'm the boy, aren't I, lad? You know, I put bums on seats, lad, and I put people, people want to watch the telly, lad, when I'm on it. I, I'm just one of them people, lad. People say they're drawn to me, and it's just because I'm the way I am. I don't try and act like, don't try and act like nothing. I'm just me. What you see is what you get. And a lot of people can relate to that. I, I don't try and put on no big act and try and be anything I'm not. Like, a lot of people used to think that, but once they watch me podcast and watch me vlogs, they, they realise that this is just me and this is who I am. And if you don't like it, leg it. If you like it, sound, I like it. You know what I mean? Paddy, just in front of you. 
Uh, Molly McCann was in here earlier and I asked her about the whole thing and I said, wish, if I wish you'd be there to back you up, she wished she was there and joked that this is what happens when we leave you by ourselves for two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it is, lads, funny. My videographer weren't even there to video at all, lads, so we need to try and get the CCTV. But, yeah, I was on my own, lads, stood there and if they were there, it's a good job they wasn't there, though, to be honest, because Ellis and Adam would have been putting people at kip. Have you seen the size of them all? They're all about that big, lad. You know what I mean? If Ellis or Adam got their hands on them, lad, they'd all, they'd all be snoozing in the fucking in the reception. And finally, um, Paul Craig was here, and he said that he believes that um, there's cards also in Liverpool Manchester later this year. Have the UFC talked to you about a Liverpool card? And obviously, I'm guessing you'd be in the main event, right? I'm guessing so. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm guessing it will be. No, they haven't spoke to us about anything like that. The only thing about Liverpool, lad, is the only venue really, apart from a stadium, is the Echo Arena. And I was selling that out on my own, off my own back with just the cage warrior's name attached to it. Never mind the UFC name. So the Echo Arena's far too small now. The O2 Arena's too small when I'm on the card. I said this months ago, lad, you just need a bigger stadium with me on it. So West Ham's ground um, or Tottenham's ground or something like that. Anfield or Goodison. I wouldn't even mind fighting in Goodison, lad. Good Al Wooderson, you know what I mean? Mm. I wouldn't mind fighting there. That'd be the only good thing about Goodison Park. Yeah, that. it would, lad, and it'd be a dream come true for Molly, but I know for a fact over the next three, four, five years, Anfield's happening. It's going to happen. I want them to wait till the stand's finished. Mm. That's another 10,000 there, you know what I mean? And then we have, like, the biggest gate the UFC's ever seen. Mm. Uh, just one more, sorry. I saw you on the pitch in one of your vlogs with a Champions League mic in your hand. Uh, what was that like? Just, you know, kind of surreal, obviously. You want a big, a big night for Liverpool and a big night for you. Yeah, it was surreal, lad. It was unbelievable being on the side of the pitch. We were in there hours before him um, kick-off as well. And it's, it's like being in a church, lad. It's just dead airy. It was mad. My score prediction was fucking way off, though, <laughs> wasn't it, lad? <laughs> Said we win 3-0 and we got beat 1-0. <laughs> Paddy, um, Paddy, over here, sir. Yes, PT. What's That's happening, great. fella? I wanted to know, I was speaking about this with Molly earlier as well. A lot of people see... You right say from the US, they they think you've just popped up overnight, but you have this whole career beforehand. Like you popped up in twenty fourteen, you were very well known in Liverpool and in European MMA in general. And there was a point, like as strong as your belief is now, in twenty sixteen, I believe it was maybe twenty seventeen, around the Sauron back fight when that when we didn't know if this moment would ever happen, we didn't know if your you know if your future actually involved fighting. Do you ever think about those moments and how far you've actually come since then and what you've had to fight through to get to this moment? Yeah, I do think back at them moments to realise like what I've actually come through to get here. A lot of people think, oh, it's just a fight and it's mad, lad. Some people who've only watched UFC think I'm a striker. I'm far from it. But I've been fighting since I was 16 and fighting professional since I was 17. You know what I mean? I became a world champion on Cage Warriors at the age of 21 when I wasn't taking nothing seriously. I was still out partying two nights a weekend, having two hours sleep and then going to the gym on a Monday morning. Um, I, back then, I was just a fighter, where now I'm an athlete. And it's mad when I look back now because I think, oh, I wish I wouldn't have lost them fights, especially like the back one where I had them in the rear naked choke and my right hand was cabbaged, so I couldn't finish the choke. If I would have had the other arm under, he would have went asleep. But when I look back now, it's a good job I lost that fight because I had to go through them tough times. I had proper battles with mental health and depression and I was waking up crying every morning, going to bed crying. And then I had to come through the other side of that to realise the opportunities I had and think about my family and my mates and my missus and all them that do nine to five jobs and the opportunities that I've got in front of me. I had to realise what I had. So from after that, when I got back after getting my me, me wrist fixed again, I just knuckled down and I think everyone's seen that because went on a three-fight win streak with three first-round finishes and it's about to be a four-fight win streak with four first-round finishes. Like, without them tough times, I wouldn't be where I am to this now this day. It's that, it's that simple. I, I had to prepare you as well for this kind of fame because, like, you know, the dogs in the street knew who you were when you were 19. <laughs> and, th and now, obviously, you're a huge commodity. As Jose said, People, taxi drivers ask me, why have people in Dublin asking me about you constantly? Like, has that moment, the, the, the fame that you had at Cage Warriors, has that prepared you for this star, star you're having now? Yeah, it has. Because when I was 21 and I won that belt, I was acting a bit like Billy Big Bollocks. You know what I mean? Just going around like, oh, I'm the boy. You know what I mean? I thought I was better than I was. thought I was some sort of celebrity. I had all people clinging on to me because I could get them into nightclubs and I could get them things. You know what I mean? So I needed that fall from grace, to be honest, when I was a bit younger. I needed to realise and... 
I did, and now I just keep my circle small, my close friends close, my missus, my family, my gym family, you know what I mean? It's just, as I say, without all that back then, the realisation, because when I won that belt, I thought I was someone, mate, I thought I was, I was king of the world, lad, and then you lose it and you realise who the real ones are. So without them times, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today. It's as simple as that. Oh well, yeah, I think a lot of people who watch it going up were a bit, you know, disappointed. There was no crowd for the old debut, and now we're gonna have a packed out O2, and we're gonna obviously hear the the famous entry. Like I mean, how much how much time do you have to put into preparing for that rather than the fight itself? Because Not it's like a big moment. It's a big moment, but that's just me. That's me when I walk in the gym anymore. Every morning a song comes on. I just rap every lyric to every song or dance to a dance tune, you know what I mean? I, I can't help it, that's just the way I am, that's just me. And that's why I always say it annoys me when MMA fighters put on these acts and try and be like WWE wrestlers. It's like, this, be real, be who you are. That's what I do, and everyone loves me for it. And if they don't, they hate me, but they still turn it on and want to watch me, don't they? Nice and Paddy, cheers. Paddy, just down over here. What's happening, lad? Yes, lad, it's happening. Um, I just wanted to ask you about like your weight class at the moment. Obviously, you're fighting at lightweight. I've been watching your vlogs on YouTube, and I think you've made a few references there about you know how how you're really trying to stay disciplined, so you make weight and trying to you know cut down on the binge eating, just the unhealthy eating really. But then I know that you used to fight at featherweight too, so you're saying that it's increasingly difficult at the moment. How on earth did you make that weight for featherweight before? Well, that's the thing. Well, I used to kill myself absolutely kill myself to make 145 like everyone here has seen the clip when i'm sick in the cage you know what i mean the night before i'd cut 19 pounds in a bath and a sauna and stuff you know what i mean that night of that morning when i had to go i had the extra two hours to go and make weight i couldn't get in and out the sauna i got physically pulled in the sauna and pulled out the sauna i'll never forget adam saying if he dies it's not on me you know what i mean and when I fought Nada cut like 7.7 kilo overnight, which is about 16, 17 pounds. And I got a DEXA scan that day. And I went and got another DEXA scan the other day and he com- cross-referenced them and compared them over. And he said, if a doctor would have looked at that DEXA scan, he wouldn't have let me fight the next day. I was 0.2 kilo away from acute kidney failure and one kilo of water weight away from dying. Wow. And I had the testosterone in my body of a two-year-old boy. And I still went and done five rounds the next night. I never got finished. And I got hit with some big shots. That's why I, I just know I'll never get finished, lad. Because now I'm fighting much healthier. When I fought a rose, I woke up on the Monday morning, 77.7 kilo. And fought at 65.8. This week, I think I woke up at 76 kilo dead. You know what I mean? I was 165 this morning. I don't have to struggle to make weight anymore. I don't have to kill myself. But... The worst lying MMA fight I can ever say is, I'm going to keep my weight down after this fight. I'm going to, I'll be honest, lad, I've said it every time, but this time I'm not. I'm going <laughs> to get fat again. I can't wait. It's going to be boss. So after your first uh, fight, after your debut, uh, we got the news that you got a seven-figure deal with Barstool Sports. I uh, just want to ask you, how does that make you feel that after just one fight, you get something like that? And I'm not going to start asking you the details of the yeah, seven lad, figures. Yeah, Barstool is the best company in the world, lad. They can't... Uh, Barstool was made for me and I was made for Barstool. Seriously, when I went into that office, I was just like, this is this is me. This is me. You know what I mean? It's just a company what epitomizes me. And I can't thank them enough. Everyone over there, like, it's the biggest. I don't reckon anyone's ever had a sponsorship deal after one fight like that. And it's going to be a great partnership. It's going to grow into it even more and more. I can't wait to go back over to the States after this fight and get some more stuff done with Barstools just to, to thank them. With a seven-figure deal after just one fight, how do you stop that from being a distraction? Because we all know, like, it's easier to wake up out of bed when you when you're not uh, when you've got not got that much money. But when you've got that kind of contract, how do you stay motivated? I don't do this for money or fame, lad. I do this for legacy. I do this to prove that I'm the best out there. I've never done it for anything else, and I'm a very modest person, lad. I, even though I'm getting paid the seven-figure deal over two years, lad, if a can of coke is 80 pence in one shop and a pound in another shop I'm walking the extra five minutes to that shop for the can of coke for ATP I'm just like that <laughs> and just a final one from me um, fighting aside we know you're a massive Liverpool football club fan um, 
I just want to ask you, from the current team at the moment, if you could pick a five-a-side team, who would go in your five-a-side team? Five-a-side team, yeah. Go on then. Got to be obviously Alisson, Van Dijk. Um, Alisson, Van Dijk. Phil Babel. <laughs> Alisson, Van Dijk, Fabinho, Salah and Luis Diaz, because he's an absolute phenomenon. That, that man has turned up and absolutely ripped the Premier League apart already. He's going to be some some player in, lad. Good luck on Saturday. Ah, we don't need luck here, lad. Don't worry about that. You, 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 in terms of that uh, social media clip with, with Tapuria, it feels like you've really controlled the narrative of that a little bit by, by posting in the way that you've done. Is there a part of you as like a kind of a businessman almost that thinks this is good for you in the future because you're building potential fights down the line. People will be a lot more interested for you potentially fighting Tapuria down the line than they ever would have been without that moment. Is, is there a part of you that thinks these kind of beefs, these altercations and using social media is, is good for you for future business? People are interested in me whoever I fight. Yeah. doesn't matter. I don't need any altercations like that. He needs altercations like that because no one knew who he was. But now it's great, lad, because no one even's going to know him as his name. He's always forever going to be Mr. Hand Sanitizer. <laughs> like, that's it. He got a hand sanitizer that bounced off his head when he come over on the bounce, Santa Rack Dad. And he got terrorised. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's one of them things. But I've got to be a lot smarter with me social media, lad, because as you know, I've had two accounts stuff off me now, and the second account had 920,000 followers. I've, I've lost out on so much money in sponsorships over the past two weeks. Three weeks, um, Instagram are proper messing with me livelihood, messing with the charity work I do, messing with the mental health, uh, mental health charities and people I speak to. I don't know some of them people are still here to this day because I chat with them on a daily basis and now I can't because Instagram has shut that account down. I'm a big advocate for if you make a social media account, you should have to register an ID or a credit card or something along them lines so that you can't just bully, troll and harass people because... I've had my account to cough me for bullying and harassment. When it's me who gets bullied and harassed, I just defend myself. And I don't even care when people say stuff about me. Say stuff about me all you want, but not about a three-year-old child what's fighting for his life. I, I can't sit there and let someone talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree, Eddie. mate. And how much will Molly's performance set the tone for you? Is that something you've got to keep a close eye on? Or do you have to think like, you need to kind of separate yourself a little bit because you know, the, the emotions of that fight might affect you going into your fight? Um, no, I've, I get tunnel vision, lad. Once that cage door shuts, you see the change in my face, you see what happens. Not on what goes on outside of the cage can change that for me. I know it's just me and Rodrigo Vargas in there, but I know Molly's going to get the win. We we don't lose when we're on the same card, lad. It just doesn't work like that. Have, like, you, have you got a pop to George for a, a new dressing gown after Lenny chewed up the last one? Oh, lad, he's a little <laughs> prick, isn't he, lad? <laughs> just chews everything. Luckily enough, I've just took the... That was like the... You know what you tie it together with? Yeah. I just took that out. But I've got about four dressing gowns in ours anyway. Everyone buys me them for, for like gifts for Christmas, so I've got your dressing gowns. It's when he chews the slippers, lad. That's when he gets <laughs> annoying. Me Rick and Morty slippers, he needs to swerve to you and them, mate. Cheers, man. Paddy, you mentioned... Um, just at the back here. Yeah. Oh, what's happening? Hey. Yeah, couldn't see there. <laughs> you mentioned that you don't do this for money, you do it for legacy. What, what is your legacy with the UFC? How do you see that? I've always said it from the time I was an amateur. I want to be the best that is, the best that was, and the best that ever will be. And that's just the way I see it. I've said that since I was 16. I don't do this for, for anything else. I do it to prove that I'm the best. And I want to take another step forward to doing that on Saturday night when I cave got Vargas's skull in. And you mentioned uh, previously just there about helping people with mental health and that's something that means a lot to you. Do you feel like your platform enables you to be able to do things like that? Yeah, it does. Without my platform, I can't <laughs> help people. You know what I mean? I always say that people with a platform like me should help people. It's nice to be nice. We've got this platform for a reason. Use it for good. Don't Don't use it for horrible reasons. And that's why all these in, um, websites, social media websites, they need to sort the guidelines out, the community guidelines, because as I say, I've had my account disabled at 920,000 people, like followers, and that messes with all the GoFundMe pages I help for sick kids and for charities, homeless organisations and stuff. It, uh, it messes with all the mental health charities that I help with. 
and all the mental people who have mental health issues that speak to me on a daily basis. The amount of messages I've had of people saying, oh, without you messaging me back, Paddy, I don't think I'd still be here. And, like, I have the burden on my shoulders now thinking, wow, I can't message them back today. Are they still going to be here? And if they're not, it's it's Instagram's fault because I'd still be speaking to them every day, but I can't. And then, obviously, the messing with me livelihood, I'm losing out on thousands and thousands of pounds. It's it's just one of them things, though, and if they can do what they want. Mark Zuckerberg's the biggest bully on the planet. Thank you. Good luck on Saturday. Thank Patty. you. Patty at the back over here. Um, just to follow up on that, uh, because we saw that you know you had your Instagram deleted uh, basically for clapping back at some of the bullies. Have you ever heard back from anyone at Meta or Instagram or Facebook, whatever they're calling themselves these, these days, about that incident? No, that they don't give a fuck. They message you back saying, oh, you've had your account up for bullying and harassment. You've had so many violations. Well, show me all the violations then. I want to see every violation. Bet you every violation is defending myself. And if you look at it with context, then every one of them, I have a reason to do it. Like, I don't just go out my way to say stuff about people. I don't need to. Like, it's, if someone, like, on my page, the last few times I've had, like, reports and violations, it's been when... I took people, to, I took a young lad to the match and people started commenting about his appearance. The lad had never been to a football match before and his dad had just died, so I wanted to do something nice for him. So people started commenting, discussing things about him. So I had back and forth with them. And then the last one was for little baby Lee, who you're going to see on Friday because I'm bringing him out of the way and with me. He's got brain tumour, cancer. He's got all sorts of things wrong with him. And he's three years old. He's got no hair because of all the chemotherapy. And some absolute disgusting piece of shit commented something horrible about him. And I c I've got morals, you know what I mean? I'm a human, I can't just sit there. But what I did at first, because everyone at the USC told me to, I reported the comment. And I got it with a notification back 20 minutes later. This comment does not go against our community guidelines, so we will not remove it. So then I called him a, a piece of shit. I said, you dirty piece of shit, you're a piece of vermin on my shoe. And the next day my account was disabled. It's <laughs> the hypocritical nature of Instagram and Facebook is just disgusting. And what they get away with, like, I, I just, oh, it kills me. Mark Zuckerberg's a lizard. And we heard from Alex Volkov uh, earlier. He said he shut his social media off ahead of this fight. Are you ever tempted to do that? Just turn it off for a while to, to detox from it? Yeah, of course. I've had to do that before. I've done that when I was in America for a bit and just let someone else do it. But I feel like, as I say, I like helping people, and my social media platform gives me a chance to help people. I, I'm not one of them where it's just all about me. I, I, I feel the need to help people, especially because of the platform I've got, and my social media does that. I, even the way I've started streaming on Twitch, and I had a message on Twitter the other day of someone saying, oh, lad, I know we didn't interact on Twitch, but the fact that you even streamed tonight has put a smile on my face and made me think better, and... I said to him, do you mind if I put that up? I put it on my Twitter. And getting messages like that is better than getting any sort of payment. Someone saying to me, oh, you've just made my night there just for me being myself and doing something like that. Like, not on a lever, not on a lever compared to that. The warm, fuzzy feeling you get inside. It's, it's special, lad, it really is. Thank you. Peace out, the fam. <laughs>